Mercenaries was a hell of a video game. It was one of the smartest open world games to do it, being this approachable, silly action game on the surface that hides all these really satisfying and absorbing emergent systems underneath. It's impressive too that it pulled everything it was doing off all the way back in 2005. The fact that it came out in 2005 though is also its biggest bottleneck. You could tell that Mercenaries was squeezing every drop out of consoles that were becoming obsolete. The short draw distance, the tiny cities, the low frame rate. It's a super impressive game on a technical level, all things considered, especially because every building is destructible, but it's crying for better hardware. And its third person shooting mechanics, while they did get the job done, they weren't exactly cutting edge and they felt ancient once the next gen of third person shooters really arrived. So playing Mercenaries as great as it is, it can feel like there's a ton of obvious ways it could be improved upon for a sequel, and you might want to make sure you're sitting down for this, there was a sequel. If you had even half an eye on the video game world in 2008, you'd probably seen Mercenaries 2 World in Flames and its mohawked protagonist on the side of a bus. EA went all in on marketing this thing, ads were everywhere, and one particular ad on TV had such a market tested sign scientifically calculated to be catchy song that it still sneaks into my brain when I'm trying to sleep sometimes. I'm almost thankful I can't play it in this video because of the YouTube copyright overlords. There was also a story at the time about how EA wanted to give away about $40,000 worth of free petrol from a single petrol station in London as stunt marketing for the game which caused an enormous traffic jam. Like. Who could have seen that coming? It's, it's almost like they wanted to make headlines. If you could somehow suppress the manipulative marketing charm of catchy songs and free petrol, there was still a feeling at the time that Mercs 2 was set to be the next big thing in open world games after the behemoth that was Grand Theft Auto 4. GTA 4 set a new bar for the genre on a new generation of consoles earlier that year, and maybe the next big budget, big publisher open world game could meet that new bar too. EA certainly marked marketed Mercenaries 2 like it would. And for those who'd played the first game, Mercenaries 2 looks like it was making all the obvious improvements the first game left room for. It was ticking all the boxes. The gunplay needed improving, and Mercenaries 2 improved the gunplay. It's not great, but it's more punchy, you can now sprint, you can do an over-the-shoulder aiming slide thing, it just feels better. You could add swimming, Mercenaries 2 adds swimming. You could add boats, Mercs 2 adds boats. It adds motorbikes, it extends the draw distance, it fixes up the scaling of the roads and buildings so they all feel a bit less toy box sized. It dramatically improves upon the visuals, it makes the world more detailed and bigger and makes it all seem way more like a real place. It adds more weapons and more vehicles. Really, a sequel to Mercenaries just begged to simply have more stuff. It, it begged to be a bigger production, and looking at this list of green ticks on paper, that's exactly what Mercenaries 2 is. But Mercenaries 2 is widely considered to be a worse game than the first one, because it is. Where you can list out all of its improvements super easily, like we've done, it's far less clear why Mercenaries 2 isn't as compelling. I've read a bunch of comments online that just say something along the lines of, it's hard to explain why it's worse, it just is. To order in an airstrike in the first game, you'd open up the store menu, pick out the best airstrike for the job, purchase it, aim it at your objective, and watch the explosions rain down. Simple enough. Uh, to do so in the sequel, you have to pre-purchase the airstrike from one of the handful of vendors on the map so that it's in your stockpile, open up your stockpile menu, pick the best airstrike for the job out of the ones currently in your stock, uh, make sure you have enough fuel to afford the airstrike, which is the other new currency alongside cash, aim the airstrike at your objective, check the map screen to make sure you're indeed aiming it at the right objective, because Mercenaries 2 doesn't highlight objectives until you're up really close to them for some reason, then once you've ordered in the missile strike, just as a cherry on top, you have to do a quick time event before it's delivered. Then, and only then, you can finally watch the explosions, assuming you were bothered to go through this whole process in the first place. 
fuel is way more of a limiting factor than money is. You'll end up drowning in money, but you need fuel to call anything in. And the only way to get fuel is by airlifting these big fuel tanks, which you can only do one at a time. So if you see two next to each other, which you often will, you'll need to call in a chopper to slowly pick one up, then watch it mosey out of your draw distance so you can order in another. Repeat ad nauseum. You can do side missions to extend the upper limit of how much fuel you can hold, but the max limit isn't the issue, it's that getting fuel is so tedious you won't want to. It's this death by a thousand cuts of these tiring contrived mechanics that was so much more seamless in the first game, and where in the first game you were rewarded for being ultra careful, in Mercenaries 2 if your vehicle explodes while you're in it you'll just ragdoll out and get up like it's nothing, you can fall from literally any height and survive with three hit points which I tested and spent an eternity falling only to land and get up with three hit points. Uh, when you're low on health your HP seems to become a lot more resilient too, it's a sort of a cheap trick to make you think you're closer to dying than you are. In the first game you might find yourself sending in airstrikes from afar to take out enemy tanks so that you can fly yourself in to extract some hostages, but in Mercenaries 2, it's just not worth the hassle to do anything like that. It's, it's not worth bothering to make sure you have the right missiles in stock, or to make sure you have enough fuel, or to make sure you're aiming at the right building, or just simply doing that quick time event might seem one step too annoying. Uh, hijacking certain vehicles now requires a quick time event too, which is another one of the thousand cuts. Mindlessly brute force your way through fights because it's the path of least resistance. Just let your helicopter get shot down, you'll always survive the fall. Just steal one of their tanks and shoot all the buildings you need to knock down, it's fine. You won't even have to think about the fuel or the airstrikes or any of that stuff. You, you barely need to even manage your relationships with the factions because they're harder to aggravate. Just walk forward and shoot. Where the first game railroaded you into being strategic and thoughtful about every fight, Mercenaries 2 does the exact opposite, and in doing so it leans heavier on its gunplay mechanics in a way the first game didn't have to. The shootouts may be more enjoyable here in isolation, but it too often feels like they're the only thing to enjoy here, and with all the systemic stuff being a non-factor, Mercenaries 2 feels more akin to being a sequel to Just Cause than to Mercenaries. The first game had this really compelling drip feed progression system too, where you'd start out in shoddy cars that couldn't even knock over traffic poles or light fences, and when you eventually got yourself a tank that could mow over walls, it was incredibly satisfying, not to mention the eventual joy of flying helicopters. In Mercenaries 2, small cars can knock over any physics objects, you drive a tank in the first mission of the game, uh, and the first time I saw a vendor that sold helicopters, which was less than two hours into the game, I bought myself 51 of them. I was just that rich already, and being so rich there wasn't an incentive to earn more money through the side content, which included the return of the high profile target extractions that are no longer framed by a deck of cards. To use an appropriate for this series idiom that I'm embarrassingly proud of, if the first game was a perfectly balanced house of cards, Mercenaries 2 doesn't get the balance right, and so the whole thing comes tumbling down. All the cards, or rather all the emergent game systems, are still here, but instead of being precisely built on top of each other, they're hastily bolted together with duct tape. Which is a shame because outside of those systems it's hard to muster too much enthusiasm for the storytelling or the setting or the characters. You pick from the same three mercenaries at the start, and I played this game back in the day as Peter Stormare's character, so this time I chose Jennifer Hales. It's set in a fuel conflict in Venezuela, you have a small gang at a hideout rather than being the lone soldier you were in the first, there's traditional cutscenes in place of sitting in a chair and being lectured at, the writing is grating, and tonally it's all a fair bit sillier which isn't the right decision. The main story is also super short, it ends with an abrupt quick time event boss which is very 2008, uh, bugs plague the whole game, and it all comes across as very unfinished. Between this and The Saboteur, Pandemic seemed to have a knack for only engaging with tragic real life settings in a really awkward way. North Korea in the first game felt appropriately miserable, at least when the characters weren't trying to crack jokes, but here a layer of levity is lost because war-torn Venezuela is mostly limited to being a cool place to have 80s action movie explosions. 
Apparently a theme in the writer's room when they were making this game was having to concertedly avoid being too controversial and the game went through frequent rewrites and you can tell. It didn't stop the game from actually being controversial though, the Venezuelan government to no one's surprise wasn't too happy. There's a great video by gamers that tells this story if you'd like to know more, I'll link it somewhere. It's funny reading pre-release developer interviews where they describe North Korea as a really cool controversial ripped from the headlines conflict but not the sexiest location which is why they moved to Venezuela. It, it speaks to how much they're willing to dig into these settings really. I guess 80s action movie vibe are still fun on the surface, and we do get a cool soundtrack out of it, at least. But at some point, it feels like Pandemic just didn't fully understand what made Mercenaries 1 great. It's almost like the stars happened to align for the first game, like it was simply a fluke. Now, obviously I can't speak for what actually happened behind the scenes, but I know the game was delayed a bunch, and I imagine it being clearly unfinished played a massive role in how it turned out. What I can speak to, and what Mercenaries 2 highlights best, is how hard it is to pull off such an ambitious concept, and in turn how amazing it is that the first game did so. Like both games are giant open worlds where every single building is destructible and they're filled with physics objects and they have all these amazing concepts running alongside each other and so if nothing else, Mercenaries 2 is at least enjoyable to analyze while playing and because of the novelty that comes with the basically unmatched to this day level of destruction here, aided by the production values and the competent combat mechanics, Mercenaries 2 still coasts by being fun light entertainment despite its issues. You'll see a lot of love for Mercenaries 2 online and probably in the comments of this video if you go looking and it's not terribly hard to see why. Mercenaries 2 also highlights why you don't see many games like Mercenaries 2. It had all the development budget, it had all the marketing, all the hype, a super experienced developer, and it still wasn't a success. It tried to spin too many plates. I mean, on top of everything, the game also boasted a two-player online co-op mode, which I remember quite enjoying back when it was online, even if the difficulty didn't change to account for a second player. Mercenaries 2 aimed for the stars and it ended up crashing before it got close. I'd argue that because of its high profile, it shifted the needle across the industry towards open world games being safer and sticking closer to proven formulas. Mercenaries 2 showed the business why there was too much risk in greenlighting games like Mercenaries 2. Which leaves it in a funny place, it's equally fascinating and frustrating. In an alternate reality where Mercenaries 2 came out first and Mercenaries 1 was the sequel, 2 would be recognised as an uneven but boundary pushing game and one would be celebrating for refining the groundwork that 2 laid out. As it is though, Mercenaries 2 takes one step forward and two steps back, and will sadly remain a what-if story. A third game did actually start development despite 2's failures, but it was quickly cancelled when EA shut Pandemic down in 2009, leaving behind this feeling that the series never reached its full potential. Thankfully, we can pretend that Mercenaries 2 actually did come out first by playing this PS2 port that has worse graphics than the original game, and I just couldn't help myself but check this out. Like, look at this thing, it is, it is charmingly hideous. It's a cobbled together PS2 port in 2008, trying its best to keep its handful of frames chugging. Uh, I made sure I recorded this on a physical PS2, just to show it in its true glory. I've covered a lot of ports like this over the years and I've spoken to a lot of developers who've made ports like this over the years so when I play this my mind just goes straight to what it must have been like making this thing. It, it can't have been easy. Uh, Pandemic didn't do this, the, the job was handed to a studio called Artificial Mind and Movement, later known as Behaviour Interactive, and it's fascinating to pick apart how they've adapted the game down. It's running on the Mercenaries 1 engine, which is Pandemic's proprietary engine called the Zero Engine where the physics and graphical quirks and a whole bunch of the same assets carry over. The heads up display for example is almost exactly the same as the first game. And remarkably this is something of a complete Mercenaries 2 experience. Uh, everything is scaled back dramatically but it hits all the major marks. 
there's a big open world, all of the more memorable main missions are here in some form, all of the factions are here, the faction relationships are here, the disguise system is back, there's side missions, there's helicopters, boats and swimming have been plugged into this engine. I, I kind of half expected this to be some completely different linear thing, but no, the, the work's been done here to make this reflect the main game, for better or worse, though they didn't add sprinting, which I really wish they did. Putting this next to the main version though is kind of stark. This is the opening area of each game, it's 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 night and day. Uh, taking a look at the two maps, you can see how the PS2 version approximates the main version's map with far less density and a lot more simplification, like zooming in on Maracaibo in the northwest highlights this best I think. There's less city blocks, there's less winding roads, it, it's just, it's sort of an approximation. Driving through Maracaibo, it still tries to hit all the landmarks in its own dreary way. You can compare the underpasses, for example, and see how so much detail has been stripped away with the textures and the geometry. Like, look at the walls or how there's no traffic sign. It all feels a lot more off in scale on PS2 too, just like the first game did. You can compare the Universal Petroleum Headquarters, it's very big, barren and empty on PS2. I'm sure you're starting to see a theme here. The home base is a similar story in that regard, it feels more lifeless and details like the hedge maze have been taken out. Uh, you can see the main big bridge out of the city, which fades into existence as you drive along it on PS2. All very low poly, all doing its best to keep up with the far prettier PS3 version. It's also amusing how the cutscenes have been squashed and stretched out wide, like that's not my doing, the pre-rendered cutscenes are just really wide in this game. You gotta do what you gotta do to save space, I guess. Funnily enough, the PS2 port handles a few things better than the PS3 version because it handles them in the same way the original game did. Like, if a vehicle explodes with you in it, you'll die. Vehicles are less resilient here, and if you fall too far, you'll die now too. And so, you kind of actually have to think more strategically at times here. One mission had me stealing a car off an island where I had to use a helicopter to carry it, and it was surprisingly thrilling clearing out the place and trying to keep both the car and the chopper from exploding. Thrilling moments are very few and far between though, like for the most part this is a very slow, lifeless, unbalanced and drab game. It, it feels like busy work. And there's difficulty spikes here that are enough to put a wet blanket over any enjoyment to be had. An early turret section is infuriating, having your chopper get shot down by virtually invisible RPG enemies on the ground is insanely frustrating, and there's no mid-mission checkpoints so restarting these long missions when you die at the end is just exhausting. I tried to do extra side missions to unlock better vehicles and weaponry, to better prepare myself for the difficulty spikes, but then you'll get thrown into no-win situations over and over, no matter how much you prepare. Uh, midway through the game you have to fly a helicopter back to your base to make it back in time before the mission fails, and there's just a bunch of anti-air stuff waiting for you that shoots you down when you arrive, which will have you restarting a 20 minute mission that involves travelling across the entire map from the top. It's it's infuriating, so I used a god mode cheat to finish it, but I couldn't bring myself to finish this game. But hey, Mercenaries 2 on PS2 is actually kind of fascinating in terms of scale and ambition. It's, it's not a good product, but in some ways it is more feature rich than the first game with the boats and the swimming, the map is huge, all the buildings do seem to be destructible, and there's a part of me that appreciates it for even trying to be as big as it is. There's no reason to play this outside of an unhealthy curiosity, a smaller game probably would have turned out to be more enjoyable, but instead Mercenaries 2 on PS2 is this dog's breakfast of an attempt that is kind of impressive on some level, super unimpressive on another, incredibly frustrating to actually play, and overall an amusing oddity that probably never should have made it to release.